Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us right here inside room number nine. It seems to me that it's get, getting livelier and livelier, if I can use such a word. I'm really happy to see you, really. I'm really happy to see you. I feel like in the cinema, actually. Uh, this is our main director, our main actor, who's going to take over in a second. Before that, let me only remind you that after this presentation, the coffee break is possible. So if, we, if you don't manage to ask questions at the end in the short Q&A that we have devoted to our next lecturer, you can do it also during the coffee break. I'm having a look at you. Will you be ready to answer the questions in between? Yep. Thank you so much. OK, ladies and gentlemen, so we are moving on to the second lecture for today. It's C++ Mythbusters. It all sounds Greek to me. I will not pretend that I understand, but you do. That's the most important thing. That's why I'm moving aside and I'm leaving the ground for the person who gave us some fun facts about him. So Victor is a senior software engineer on the Visual C++ team, helping to improve the tools he's been using for years. One of his hobbies is actually tidying up and modernizing aging code bases and has been known to build open source tools that help this process, Clank Power Tools. Does he have anything more for you for today? I'm sure he does. Please give a warm applause to Victor Chura. I'm so happy to be here with you folks. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be back on site for conferences. It's been three years since I've been here, and I'm so happy to be back. And I'm sure you all are, so let's get started. Um, just to make sure, uh, yeah, do ask questions. Um, but if, even if we don't have to address everything uh, on, um, right now, uh, do find me in the coffee break right after this, and I'm happy to chat some more about uh, any of these topics, because there are going to be a lot to cover today. So I'm going to start by trying to frame a bit about the C++ community. We're a quite large community, um, around four or five million developers. And when it comes to controversial issues, we're quite uh, vocal. And we like to pick up uh, discussions. And sometimes they can become even fairly energetic. And the reason is that w I think we're very fragmented as a, as a community. And this is the, based on the breadth of the community, on how many uh, folks are actually using the, the tools, the language, and ecosystem. And based on the background and experience we each bring from our C++ niche, from our industry, from the stuff we've been working on, from our goals and priorities, and what matters for our projects. And uh, trying to take uh, Bjarna's elephant metaphor a little bit further, uh, I, this is my take on it, is that, uh, and apologies to the vegans in the room, and I think we each see a different part of the, the, the ecosystem, a different part of the tooling, and uh, we have sometimes conflicting priorities in what we consider vital for uh, our tools and our um, tech stack. So let's discuss about this. Uh, let's discuss about sources of good information. There are plenty out there, from uh, the almost standard CPP core guidelines to opinionated best practices sometimes, established idioms out there, books. Yes, books are still a thing. There are still plenty of good books out there, even modern ones. Uh, conference presentations, like we're going to have all day today. And of course, Stack Overflow and similar platforms. And just a fair warning, uh, if something looks like a, a hot take, uh, it probably is. And we have to learn a bit to disambiguate between uh, serious uh, opinions, serious uh, technical points, and sometimes amusing uh, lamentations about our tools and languages. And mixed up in all of this are plenty of myths. And some myths stem from uh, obsolete information, because we've been around for almost 40 years, if not more. And some stem from bad teaching materials. That's, that's just re the reality. And speaking of teaching, um, I want to do a quick aside here on this topic, because I care a lot about this. 
uh, I, uh, some of the things uh, we're going to talk about might seem obvious or um, known to you, uh, but they do come up. They do come up uh, when we discuss with uh, interns or students or new folks joining our project, uh, and we need, do need to uh, allocate proper time to discuss them and make them uh, known to everyone. And there are questions I get when I do guest lectures. Um, I do sometimes guest lectures at my alma mater and other uh, universities. And I see these questions from students uh, who are trying to um, approach a, a new learning path, a new language, a new framework, and so on. Uh, a little bit more about uh, my rants on, on teaching C++ and teaching a programming language in general to students uh, in this presentation that I did um, a while back. Speaking of Stack Overflow, I think we've all been there and we need to appreciate this a bit more and understand that uh, even though we might feel comfortable uh, with the, uh, the place we are now in our career, in our experience, uh, we need to be aware of uh, new folks joining uh, our community and remember how it is to learn a new, something new and be patient and understanding and trying to distill uh, the weeds and distill the knowledge and be kind to share it with others when they're starting up. So how it started? Um, it actually started a, a, a while ago. Uh, Jason and I uh, did a planned like an improv session. Uh, we discussed ab about a bunch of um, s such myths in, in C++ uh, flying around. And we, uh, we collected a, a short list of things that uh, we wanted to discuss about. And we did an improv session, totally unscripted. We said, like, let's see what we can come up with. Let's riff off and see uh, what, what conclusions can we draw. And it was an interesting experiment. Uh, uh, that was a long stream. I think almost two hours. And what I, what I want to do with uh, this presentation is to instigate a healthy dialogue. So do speak up, uh, bring your own take on this, uh, bring your own opinions on the items um, I'm presenting, and come up with new ones. Uh, I've, been, I've done this presentation a few times now, and I already collected a bunch of uh, interesting feedback and new ideas, and I'm, I'm already uh, composing uh, a new version of this, so something like episode two for next year. So do share your experience, do share your takes, uh, as I value your opinion. Um, the usual uh, uh, things with um, Mythbusters kind of series, um, and of course, the, the programmer side of things, where uh, it depends is the safe answer whenever in, in doubt. So let's test this. Uh, IO streams are slow. Uh, just kidding, this is kind of obvious. Not really a myth. We've known this for years. C20 modules will solve all our C problems. Not. And coroutines shipped in C20, well, with no real library support. Um, not really. I love this uh, slide from uh, Kevlin Henney uh, at C++ on C a few months back. I chuckle every time I see it. I just can't help myself. I think it really captures the situation as it stands now. Um, so I think you got how it works. Uh, this would be the, the part one presentation, like I told you. And I do invite other speakers to join in this myth-busting series. Uh, to just start collecting uh, and opening discussions about these items. Uh, the older folks in the room might remember the, the times before Stack Overflow or before forums when uh, we used to reference uh, Scott Meyer I items by number and we, <laughs> we, we knew what they meant in, in discussions and code reviews, like item 14 had a special meaning. And uh, even Guru of the Week series, where we had interesting uh, bits and we addressed them by, by numbers. So <laughs> I, I kind of like that, uh, that scheme and, and want to uh, revive it here. So let's start. Printf, sprintf, a family of functions are very fast. And this usually comes up in the context of comparing them to IO streams. And if the bar is that low, yes, they are fast. Uh, but 
uh, they come with their own problems, and uh, we need to raise awareness about this. And uh, Sprintf, for example, uses uh, the global locale, and that implies a mutex lock. And we all know that mutexes are bottlenecks, right? For example, on macOS, sprintf, that is in the system libraries, ends up spending almost all its time uh, in, inside that lock. So um, just a case study that I linked here. By the way, the, sh the, the slides should be shared already. And uh, mine are, are sprinkled with links to useful uh, further uh, reading. So I encourage you to explore uh, more the topics that you're interested about. So an interesting uh, Blender case study here where uh, re by replacing sprintf with uh, a format library, which is easy to adopt, uh, they actually did a, a 3 to 4x x speed up on Mac OS and a 20% 20, uh, 20 speed up on Windows, just by, by this replacement. And I do encourage you to consider the alternatives. Uh, if you can use C++20, uh, use standard format. Uh, but even if you're not able to, to upgrade yet, uh, do adopt the, the format li library, which is very easy to incorporate. It's a, it's a header-only library, and it's very easy to, to incorporate in your project. And the replacements should be um, somewhat trivial. And you're going to have tremendous speed-ups. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong direction. So be aware, in general, I think that the still information here is be aware of standard functions that use the locale. Uh, not, not everyone is uh, familiar with that, and I think we should raise awareness of uh, which functions we use actually uh, go down to, to locale, because uh, there are traps laying everywhere. It most recently, uh, a, a, bag, a bug here, a performance bug. I, I consider performance issues bugs. So. Uh, you don't need to read the code or understand it. Just, uh, I want to draw attention to uh, recent problems and recent fixes that we're, we're doing in, in local related stuff. And folks should be aware, if not scared, of functions using uh, the standard locale. Moving on, uh, as humans, we always depend on tools to do our job. And we've, for millennia, tried to improve the tools we're using. And in, in programming, which is a very young discipline in, in humankind, we're constantly innovating, constantly building, building new and better tools. And what I hear is that C++ is not easily toolable. And this really um, annoys me. And, and the reason it annoys me because uh, I spent uh, almost all my 20-year career building tools for developers. And uh, I continue to, to do that. Uh, that's why I, I joined the Visual C++ team to help improve the tools that I've been using all this, all this time. And I want to uh, address the, the issue of C++ tooling. And just recently, Jason uh, did a, a, an interesting survey. Uh, and I, I like the, the, the framing of this, that we are actually in a golden age of C++ tools. And you don't need to read everything there. I, I just included it to uh, make a point in, in how many of them there are. And just a, it's a quick survey of, of existing tools. The idea is that depending on, on the types of tools that, that we need, we need the problem of, with C++ is that we have too many tools. And we have too many tools doing the same thing. And we need to figure out which ones are good for us. We need to explore. We need to be more experimental in our approach and willing to try out new things and see how they work for our needs, for our projects, for our platforms. Uh, either it's a static analysis tool or fuzzing or testing or um, um, dynamic analysis, sanitizer, anything. So we need to explore to find, find a better debugger, find a better a static analyzer, and we need to learn them. Uh, once we, we narrow down and, and find something that works for us. And why not maybe use two or two, uh, two or three different tools for the same purpose because they complete each other. That's an option too. Uh, we might not have the standard or the unique uh, package management tool or the unique build system like other ecosystems might have, but we have plenty to choose from. 
the, my, my recommendation is that uh, we need to drill down and spend more time in learning them, figure out the documentation, figure out the switches, the use cases, the examples, and master the tools that we're using so that, so that uh, we feel confident when using them and not complain that we don't have the standard one. We have plenty. We, we really are in a golden age of C++ tools. Moving on, um, standard regex, it's too slow for production use. Uh, this one's actually uh, slightly bit embarrassing. Uh, when Jason and I did the, the, the stream uh, a while back, we actually spent more than 10 minutes uh, coming up with a piece of code you see on the slide here. And yes, it was two of us. Uh, and the reason is that um, neither of us was very familiar with the API that uh, standard regex offers. And for sure, it wasn't intuitive enough for us to figure it out on the spot uh, without checking the documentation and uh, understanding the, the consequences of what we're trying to do. And the task we set out it was trivial enough. It was just parsing a simple config file. So for sure, uh, regex, uh, standard regex uh, is not an, an ergonomic API, and it do, does come with uh, serious gotchas there. And a funny thing, it's so slow to, to compile, it actually timed out Compiler Explorer. Uh, so <laughs> um, that was funny. So it's very, very slow to compile. Uh, and it's also slow at runtime. And it does come with a bunch of performance gotchas. Uh, you, you have to take really good care of taking the, the, the constructors or the CMatch uh, objects out of the hot paths uh, because they're expensive to, to, to build. And, uh, if possible, you need to, to cache them. I do recommend uh, a safer, uh, cleaner alternative, which is CTRE, Compile Time Regular Expression Library, uh, which is very fast to compile. It's modern, it has a much cleaner API. It even supports string view at the uh, API level. And it builds the regular ex expression automata at compile time. Moving along. Standard optional inhibits optimizations and complicates APIs. Let, let's break this down. Um, let's see a, a, a very, very simple example of uh, a function yielding a standard optional value and see if the compiler has trouble uh, seeing through the, all of this. So we have a, a get size function that needs to calculate the length of a string literal there. And if we map this to the, the assembly output to see, uh, we already see that the compiler uh, automatically figured out the, the, the length of that string literal without needing to actually do any function call in the process. So it, it saw through all, everything. And if we try to demystify some of the uh, large uh, integers we see there in the assembly output, uh, we can actually figure out uh, how how the compiler lays out the, the string linter information. So this definitely is quite transparent to the compiler. Uh, it sees through uh, all the in optional indirection, and uh, we don't pay any cost of actually calling uh, the intermediate uh, get size function there. But you might say that this is a sp particular case of small string optimization. So let's uh, choose a longer string, and indeed, we're forcing uh, the compiler to go to the heap. We see the, the heap allocations there. Uh, but same thing, same effect. The compiler still, still sees through everything and is able to boil down everything to the, to, um, the direct result we need there in terms of the string length 23. Again, this is uh, fairly transparent to the compiler and not, not really a challenge. And you, you might say oh, this myth is busted. But it, there are some corner cases where, that we need to be aware of. And I've done a slight change to the code. I don't know if you're noticing it. I hoisted the, the string literal there into a separate variable of type string, standard string. And this might seem like a trivial equivalent transformation to what we had before, but it has consequences. Um, I did a, a diff of the assembly there, but you don't need to worry about the details. Just know that now the, the code does a lot more work in the process. Why is that? 
Well, the, the, the problem is here is that we're copy constructing a string now. And this uh, constructor of standard optional is to blame for this because it constructs an, an optional object that contains the value as if directly initializing with T, with the value. So the problem in our example is that we have a mismatch. If we're going back here, we have a mismatch between the return type of the function, which expects an optional of string, and we're actually returning a string. And in such an example, it might seem obvious because it's right there. Uh, they're they're close, close to each other. But in, in, in real, real life, more complicated examples, uh, and maybe if we have more return paths in our function that return different kinds of things that are, that are constructible from each other, it might not be that obvious. So we need to be very careful because that standard optional constructor is meant to make the code ergonomic and be able to construct fluently. Uh, but in some situations, like this one, it does come with performance gotchas. So it, it will force uh, a standard uh, string copy there. So we need to be aware. And um, when, when dealing with optional, uh, in especially around return types, we need to be aware we're returning the right type and we're not falling through any conversion. And the other bit of this is that uh, I hear a lot is that standard optional complicates APIs. So it's attractive to folks because they want to model this value that might not be there, but they, they, they don't know or haven't figured out yet how to build proper APIs using uh, this abstraction. And the idea here is that uh, too many folks try to look inside the box. Uh, and the box is the, the standard optional there. And or, or are trying to use standard optionals like some kind of error checking, error handling, by right? checking, it, it, do I have a value? Uh, and my advice here is that uh, when in doubt, take inspiration from other APIs. Uh, if you're familiar with other programming languages where uh, such a type has been around for, for more time, uh, check out their libraries to see how they're using, uh, to see uh, idiomatic usage around this. But I'm going to give you some more advice. Um, there, there's a, a series of articles um, about this topic, and I'm not going to go in depth about this. I do have a completely different presentation uh, that's called um, The Imperatives Must Go, where I go into more details about uh, using uh, uh, such patterns of functional composition using um, boxes like standard optional. Uh, but there's a, a nice series of articles that explains these concepts, uh, not in a complicated way, in a mathematical or uh, abstract way, but in a rather intuitive uh, diagram uh, way. And I, I feel um, very confident that folks reading this uh, will, will get the idea quickly. Uh, the idea is to apply transformations on such wrappers, like optional, which wrap a, a potential value with its context, and do processing in stages without uh, picking at the value in the box and applying higher order functions to the context in a processing pipeline and only inspect the result at the end of the pipeline. What do I mean by this? What do I mean is, at each stage, maybe we're calling repeated or nested functions, or even within inside the same function, don't try to if else and branch out logic based on if we have a value in the optional yet or not. Rather, try to, to apply functions that work from optionals to optionals using a technique that, that I'm, I'm going to mention next uh, and, and build a processing pipeline. So briefly, without going into many details, because I have an hour-long talk just about this topic. It's about boxes and lifting operations. What do I mean by this? Is lifting the domain and codomain of functions, let's say from A to B, if a function takes an A and returns a B, these are types, uh, having a lifted function that goes from optional of A to optional of B. And this technique done in a general way 
helps us compose such operations in processing pipelines that go from optionals to optionals. One potential such functions would be an F map that might look like this. Don't worry about the, the, the implementation details, just get the feel for it. So we have a f this would be a higher order function that takes another function as argument. So it takes our function from A to B and an optional and it turns another optional. Um, or it might look like this if you prefer the, the templates. Um, I mentioned that I have a hour long presentation just on this topic, so I'm not going to go uh, on this, but I'm going to show a quick example. Let's say we have a string and we're trying to convert it, if possible, to an integer. And um, don't worry about the mechanics of how we're doing this. Yeah, we're using a, a standard library function from Charles and we have to account for possible errors and, and, and uh, other bits. Uh, and we're taking by string view for performance reasons. What I want to highlight is the, the way we're doing the processing. And I want to draw your attention to some new functions that you might not be aware uh, from standard optional. And they did come in in C++23. Um, and if, even if you're not uh, able to have these functions in your standard toolset, there are uh, library implementations out there which are header only and provide this functionality as a drop-in replacement from the for the standard one until you are able to upgrade your toolchain. Uh, so there's really no excuse for not trying it out. Uh, my recommended uh, implementation is the one by Cybrand. So you can look up uh, Tartan Lama on GitHub and see the optional implementation there. One I, one I want to show you is the, the processing pipeline. So rather than having a bunch of nested control flow, if, if else blocks in some weird function uh, that it's hard to reason about, we have a linear sequence of processing. Uh, we say that uh, we're applying the string view to int function that we had defined on the previous slide. And then we do something, doesn't, doesn't matter what we're doing inside that lambda function. And then we're applying a transformation, which is a kind of F map, or else we do something else. And at the very end of the processing pipeline, which I, I try to, to, uh, to organize vertically so that it's easy to follow, at the very end of the processing pipeline, we, we see if we succeeded at yielding a value or not. So the idea is to transform a code that might be uh, callback hell or very nested in something that looks linear in nature. It, it really changes the way we compose operations. So uh, I do encourage you to, to think about this uh, differently. I know it's strange at first, but as you start using it, uh, you will see that it, it helps deconstruct code in, in a much more elegant way and, and compose it in a much more flexible way. And this is not something new. This is something that other programming languages and communities have been doing it for years. So I think standard optional doesn't complicate API if we're doing it the right way. If, if we're trying to use optional as an error checking mechanism, uh, yeah, it, it, it won't end up uh, looking nice. So I do encourage you to draw inspiration from, from others that have had these kinds of structures uh, four years and, and look at their APIs. As a C++ community, I think we, we're not very good at naming things. Um, <laughs> we have a, a few examples here that uh, prove this, uh, as well as length and size and other empty functions <laughs> that are highly inconsistent. Um, so I'm going to pick on one. Um, standard move moves. Uh, I see this more frequently from uh, folks learning C++ for the first time or folks um, learning C++ 11 for the first time. Maybe they've been doing this for a long time with uh, an older C++. Um, let's pick a very simple example, something, uh, uh, an, an echo API that takes two strings by const ref, and we're calling it uh, by providing a, a greeting 
uh, string there. Nothing unexpected here. We just print uh, hello, hello. Let's make a quick modification. And let's try to move one of the greetings there. What would you expect to see? Nothing happens. What does, what does it mean? Well, move actually doesn't move anything. Move is just a fancy cast. And it's been around for many years, well before C++11. People have been doing things like this with weird macros and tricks. Uh, move, standard move is just a fancy cast. And what happens here, uh, and we can even have two moves. And yes, I've seen this in real code. It's not made up. Uh, and again, same thing, nothing happens. We moved twice. What happened? Well, the, the consequence is that standard move is just an, an adapter, a reference cast. And we, the, the reason this works is that uh, uh, an R value reference can just bind to a const string reference that the echo function expects. So nothing just, nothing happens. We're just casting one reference type to another reference type. That's why uh, this is not even undefined. It's well defined. Nothing happens. But if we make a slight modification to our API and take those strings by value, and there are legitimate cases to take uh, things by value, we're going to see more about this later, then something happens. What would you expect? Maybe this. Uh, and the reason is that now we're actually invoking the move constructor of standard string. And why is that? Because now uh, our echo API has string by value in its argument. And this is what happens on Clang. If we switch to GCC, it's the other way around. Don't panic. That's expected. Uh, the main difference here is that now we're explicitly requesting the string move constructor. Whereas previously, it was just a const ref in the uh, argument of the API. And the move was not necessary, was not requested. Now a move is requested. So standard move prepares us for a potential move that might or might not happen, depending on the context. So standard move by itself, it's nothing fancy. But in, in the context where moves might be required, it does something. Special attention to be drawn to moving from constant values. That's just a silent copy, by the way. So yeah, standard move does not move. Um, related to this, Always pass input arguments by const reference. We've all, all learned this. It's an old tried and true from old time C++ up to modern C++. We've all learned to pass things by const reference. We've seen it already in our echo API. Let's consider a, a widget constructor. And uh, in, in C++ 11 or newer, we've learned to that we can provide uh, a move constructor as well, aside from our conversion constructor. And it might look like this. I, I think this is idiomatic. might not surprise uh, anyone who's familiar with C++11 already. However, things start to get gnarly as soon as we have more than one argument, because it becomes a combinatorial problem. If we want to cover all the cases, we need to account for all the possible combinations. And this is just two fields, two arguments in our constructor. So it definitely does not scale. A, a new pattern that has emerged in, in the last years uh, since C++11, but that, that is less familiar uh, to my, in my experience to folks, and raises questions even in code reviews, is the, the, the famous sync pattern, where we uh, take things by value. That's why I gave this example previously in, with our Echo API. When we actually want to take ownership 
of those inputs that we're constructing from the, the ID and the name, we're taking ownership of them inside our widget. That's why we say that we sync them into our fields. And we take them by value. And the reason we do that is because it's more ergonomic. This way, we cover all the bases, and we don't need to combine every possible type of uh, reference semantics, like before. And the same thing applies for setters, uh, where we want to take ownership of, of, of those fields. How, how does this work? Let's speak on the, on the setter case. Let's say we're, we're setting the name using a string literal in line there. Uh, we create a string with a literal value, and then we do the move assignment into the data member. That's what the code asks for. What if we hoist the string literal into a standard string variable? Then we create a string with a string literal value. That's what the code requests. We make a copy of the string. That's what our set, set name API requests. And then we do the move assignment into the data member. What if we change it to a move? Because we say, OK, we have this variable uh, of type string name, and we're, we, we want to explicitly pass ownership to the setter function. We don't need it anymore. Then we create the string with a string literal value. We move construct the string now. We're leveraging the move constructor of the standard string implicitly, because that's what the argument of the setter requests. And we then, inside the setter, we do a move assignment into the data member. If we're providing the two, so the, the most exhaustive thing that we can do, both the const string ref as well as the, the R value ref overloads, like we should, like we've learned to do, do the maximum thing that we can do, then we create a string with a string, string literal value and just make a copy of the string and we fall on that highlighted overload there. So what we're saving by doing the maximum possible effort, what we're, saying, we're saving is one move operation. So yes, being very explicit and providing all the right overloads for all the possible types of, of bindings and reference types, we are more efficient in some cases by one move operation. And if your type has an expensive move operation, Let's say maybe you're doing some kind of small buffer optimization, or your, or your type isn't, is more expensive to move from, then it really makes a difference. But, but for most types, it really doesn't make much of a difference to have one more move operation. Moves, in general, are cheap for most types. So the sync pattern is more ergonomic without sacrificing performance in most cases. 99% of the cases. So we need to keep that in mind. Yes, there are some corner cases. Like, for example, if we want to do this in a, in a repeated fashion, in some kind of loop that does similar processing like this, we might want to take advantage of a capacity of a string and avoid uh, respawning the string on each loop iteration. So we wanna, w might want to take advantage of the allocated capacity there for performance reasons. But those are corner cases that we need to be aware of. But in most cases, the ergonomic thing to do is use the sync pattern. Uh, th by the way, there's even a Clang tidy modernizer check to perform this transformation automatically at scale. And it works really well. Uh, uh, we've been using it in a project. And yeah, there are plenty of uh, materials about move semantics, um, plenty of books out there and information. And I think people tend to overly complicate things. Um, yes, it would be preferably if we have such things in, in the compiler itself, like Rust does with its borrow checker and the lifetime rules. But in C++, we have to rely on, on good experience and, and understanding how reference semantics works. Uh, const is not always the, the, best, the best thing. And uh, a, a, a trend we have is that const is good, context expert is good, sprinkle const everywhere, 
uh, some people understand that this is uh, like building immutable st stuff. It's not, but uh, cons doesn't always help. And um, I just want to highlight a few situations where const might be detrimental to performance. I already mentioned one, uh, trying to move from a const object, which is actually a copy. Don't const non-reference return types. Don't const local variables that might need to take advantage of implicit move on return. Don't const non-trivial value parameters that you might need to write return directly from a function. And all these are about inhibiting automatic optimizations that the compiler can take advantage of when returning types. So if we're putting const in the way, the compiler is prevented to do some of these optimizations. So that's why we need to be aware. There's a uh, Godbolt, Godbolt link there if you want to uh, see the, the examples in action. And don't const any member data. Um, it implicitly breaks uh, implicit and explicit moves and uh, common cases of assignments. So const doesn't always help. And speaking of data members, uh, one thing we've uh, we've been indoctrinated with from uh, years of OOP uh, designs is that we should encapsulate everything and make all our data members private and sprinkles getters and setters everywhere. This is typically seen as good practice uh, in, 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 in programming and has with all, comes with all good uh, uh, marketing, like enforces encapsulation, object is in control of its internal state and everything. Um, but not all types have invariants to enforce. So we did, do need to think about if it's worth it. Do we actually have invariants to enforce for our type? What kind of contracts are we offering with the API that we're building? And try to avoid adding unnecessary complexity. So don't put everything in the type just because we might need it later. Think about uh, the, the contract between the user of our type and our, the API we're providing and what we're trying to enforce for our type. Try to write simpler classes that we can reason about. And maybe don't even provide constructors. Sometimes you ju can just get away with aggregate construction. It, and there are situations where this is way more performant. So think about refactoring concerns and the fact that each public API that you provide is a commitment. It, it's, a, it's part of your contract. Think about providing it before we, we, we just do it by inertia. And sometimes structs just want to be structs, you know? Um, I do recommend this presentation by Kate Gregory about abstraction patterns. I think it's highly important that we keep reminding ourselves that what we're building is complexity. And we should try to, to think how we organize our object models so, so that we, we stay away from unnecessary complexity. I do recommend that you watch this presentation. And speaking of structs, sometimes want to be structs. Uh, I, I, I couldn't help myself, so yes, I'm going to put this presentation up. H how many of you have seen this one? I see a bunch of hands, not a lot. So it's good that I included the slide. So uh, I do recommend that you watch this keynote by Mike Acton from CppCon. I still believe it's, it was one of the best CppCon uh, keynotes. Um, it's controversial in the C++ community. Uh, but uh, it's all about software being a way of transforming data and putting data at, at the center of software building and how we create data, how we design data processing. This is what dictates the shape of the software we're building. And performance is all about software, about data layout, smart data layout, and about memory access pattern and thinking in terms of how can we lay out our data so that our processing, our 
access patterns through memory is efficient. If you want a more recent or applied case study on thinking this way, thinking in a Mike Acton way, uh, I do recommend this presentation by Andrew Kelly, uh, one of the uh, maintainers uh, and creator of Zig programming language, where he, by even uh, sporting uh, Mike Acton's uh, Hawaiian shirt there, um, he presents the, the story, the case study of uh, converting the Zig compiler uh, in, in a way that uses data-oriented design for huge performance gains. It's, it's a different way of thinking, but it's well worth the performance gains. Highly recommend it. Uh, coming up uh, closer to the end, iterators must go. This, is, uh, this was a highly influential presentation by Andrei Alexandrescu, uh, a few years back. I finally uh, found a recording to share. Um, it, it, it wasn't uh, uh, f easily <laughs> available online. Uh, highly recommend that you see it. Um, and uh, by the way, I, when I did previous presentations uh, uh, on this, I, I tried to make a joke to, to say what's up with that in a Romanian accent, but nobody knew that both Andrea and I are Romanians. So it fell flat. Uh, so, so this was uh, so controversial that uh, uh, Alexander Stepanov, uh, the, the creator of the, the iterator pattern in C++, was uh, so pissed off and said that Alexandrescu is on a crusade to eliminate iterators. And he, he launched on a huge anti-campaign to convince folks that iterators are the, rust, uh, the right abstraction to go. Um, I've put a video link to a playlist there, well worth your time to watch. Well, somebody did destroy, uh, but it took over, uh, over 10 years to do so. Uh, and I think to date, the best uh, take on the current state of uh, iterator and range uh, designs in modern programming languages is this one by Barry Revzin. Um, there are a few versions of, of this. I think this is the longer format of this presentation. I, uh, this is why I recommend this one. And uh, Barry takes a, a holistic approach of comparing the iterator models and how ranges work in C++, in D, in Rust, in C Sharp, and others. And I think it's very uh, interesting and eye-opening to see uh, slightly different takes on, on this pattern with advantages and disadvantages and um, ex code examples. So I highly recommend that you dig, it, uh, dig deep uh, if you're interested in, in understanding uh, how ranges change the way you think and why iterators might still be relevant. And yes, I am the camp uh, of folks that think that iterators are still here to stay, although I love ranges. So I would close up uh, with the thing that I keep hearing, so this, I, I keep hearing uh, year, year over year. Uh, whenever a new, so, some fancy new C++ thing comes up, uh, is that new C++ is the enemy of the old. And before we had this feature, we were able to program in C++. Uh, so uh, why do we need all the fancy new stuff? And the reason that is that uh, we need to educate ourselves to understand the new things. We need to gain experience in the industry, in using them in projects, and see how they fit, what are the best practices, what are the good idioms. Not blindly using everything new as if it's immediately superior or um, universally applicable. Some of the older things are still good, still appropriate. Some of the newer things uh, we need to gain experience with before we, we, we're using them right. We might be using them wrong. But we need to learn. We need to educate ourselves. We need to share knowledge so that we build a better understanding and use the tools appropriately. Many of the new things coming up are meant to replace bad designs or bad tools. But we need to learn how. So this is the problem with, with uh, contemporary C++. 
The problem in contemporary C++ is, the, in, is drinking from the higher fire hose. It's many new things. We need to learn about them. Some of them are complicated, uh, but well worth our time. So that's why we need to invest time to understand and see how they can help us improve our code. Um, I invite you and others to join on this bandwagon and start up discussions about things that you might consider controversial and uh, figure out together how best to teach them and how best to use them in the code. Uh, I recommend a, a one such talk in, in, uh, in this kind of series, and this is by Patrice Roy, Some Programming Myths Revisited. I think this is even more controversial than, <laughs> than what I said today, uh, but highly uh, uh, provocative and um, interesting. Watch out your sound levels, Patrice can be loud. Uh, in future uh, episodes in the series, this is some of the some topics that uh, I might cover. And yes, I'm going to draw some parallels to uh, famous C++ successor languages, uh, but that won't be the, the focus of the presentation. So um, I hope to instigate a good uh, chat with you folks. If you have questions and we have time to take them live, I'm happy to do it. If not, there's a coffee break coming up after this, so we have plenty of time to, to chat on the hallways uh, and do finding. I think I'm easily identifiable. So thank you. Mr. Mr. Victor Chira, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now the time for, let's say, this uh, symbolic two questions. So. The first with the hand up is the first to go, probably. So my colleagues will be passing on the microphones to you. Are there any questions in the room for today? Uh, please do speak up or do raise your hands and let's use this opportunity to ask questions. Let's have a look around the room. Uh, maybe or most likely during the coffee time or still, yeah, there's one person. Well, uh, because of the things you mentioned about uh, optional degrading performance, I think that one of the main things that is blamed on optional about degrading performance is that it breaks the structure's layout. Because an optional will introduce a byte after uh, every type. And if you have a structure of, say, 10 optionals of int, for example, it will take uh, 20 ints of memory with uh, different uh, the padding between them because of, because of the optional. Uh, so maybe address this in, in, another, yeah. uh, in another talk about optional breaking performance. Yeah, uh, I didn't mention at all, um, I hope that was caught on recording because it was on the mic. Uh, I didn't uh, mention at all uh, things about uh, data layout uh, and, and um, padding. M my take on this, but you're right, I, I should probably uh, add this as a follow-on uh, for uh, maybe next year, is that I, I wouldn't recommend doing uh, optional aggregation. I wouldn't recommend stacking uh, optionals inside the data structure. I would recommend uh, organizing code as uh, value types. And Maybe this is something that I should stress a bit more. I'm a firm believer of um, value semantics and organizing things such that they present themselves as value types. And if you want to drill down more uh, today, uh, there are a few uh, good presentations on this. I would recommend that you start with the one by David Abrahams at CPPCon. It's called Values, easy to find. Not exactly sure if it's published yet or not, but it should soon. And I think building our object designs so that they project themselves as value types changes the way we think uh, about uh, using optionals inside our as fields inside our data structure. I wouldn't recommend stacking optionals inside the data structure. I would recommend changing the design so that we construct value types that are optional, not values that are composed of optional stuff. 
So um, I, I'm, I'm not able to go into detail now, but I'm happy to chat about it uh, more. I, but I, I do encourage folks to find presentations on value semantics and using value-oriented design in C++. I know it's strange. We're so used to use, using reference semantics uh, that it almost feels uh, alien for C++, but value semantics is first class for C++. Any other questions? Do we have time? Thank you so much. Uh, one proposal here. So I'm just having a look maybe a bit below. Oh, here we go. So I'll just pass the mic on right here. It will be easier to move on. Uh, so I wanted to ask about this monadic optional interface. Mm -hmm. And like uh, my opinion is that it's the syntax is horribly unreadable. <laughs> and, and the question is, wouldn't ifs would simply be, be clearer to read and therefore better? I was trying to get back to it. Here. Is this what you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, the whole idea here is that uh, we don't need to, s to get stuck on the, on the function syntax. Yes, we have to retrofit this into C++. We're not in Haskell. But the way we have to do this is build, uh, building up a little syntactic sugar on top of this. So we didn't do need the function primitives, because we need them there. Uh, but we need to build up a little syntactic sugar over this. And um, again, I'm going to reference you to the presentation I have. Uh, the imperatives must go. Uh, there are some forms of it already online. The one from CPPCon is online. Uh, and I did another one last week at Meeting C++. Uh, I do show there a model of composing using something like a pipe operator, something with similar to what we do with ranges. And we can easily build syntactic sugar over primitives like this to, ha to build processing pipelines that look like ranges. Uh, I, are you familiar with how ranges work yes. in C++20? Yeah. So we can build similar abstractions like fmap and using higher order functions to chain such monadic operations one after each other. So we, we can build something like that. It's not in the standard yet, maybe, I don't know, in the future. But we can build our own abstractions to add syntactic sugar over these primitives. So as it stands now, we have just primitive functions that we can use from standard optional. But we can build a processing pipeline which says, uh, do this function, then apply this function with f, uh, uh, subsequent fmap operations. So I, I have uh, plenty of examples um, in, in that the, in the imperatives must go presentation. So I do encourage you to look there, even with optional. So I have examples with optionals. Thank you. I don't have the slides now, but I, I would put them on screen if I had them. This is not my PC. Thank you so much. I think he deserves it. <laughs>